Hey everybody, it's Tony Cotaspati, Great Vocal Majority, here to talk to you today about the Obama economy, and uh, it's just some talking about what's going on with the economy, where where we are, where we came from, where we're going, kind of thing, at some relatively high level, but I want to get into it because there's a lot of, I think, rather interesting stuff to talk about. So first of all, what we're going to do is we're going to take a look at some high-level economic indicators. And here's a chart. looks a little busy, but it's a, a time series chart for GDP here, total direct revenue, which is basically tax collections, and federal spending down here. Now, we start off with GDP, and I go from Clinton to Bush to Obama on all three of these charts. You could see under Clinton, we grew pretty pretty uh, rapidly. We had a, a great economy. We were growing at 5.8%. Under Bush, a little less, 4.6%. Under Obama, even less, 2.8%. And why is that relevant? Well, here's why. When you have weak economic growth, it means that the economy isn't growing as fast. So let's say the economy was growing at the rate it was growing under Bush, 4.6%, as opposed to Obama, 2.8%, we would get about $360 billion more a year in GDP. Had we been growing at the rate that Clinton had at 5.8%, we would be getting about another $500 billion a year in GDP. So you could see that you know this weak economic growth has an impact on our GDP, and that's you know basically the nation's income. But <clears throat> it also has an impact on the taxes that are collected. For example, if you look at the overall federal tax rate on the economy, had this income been happening, it would have increased federal tax collections down here by up to $75 billion a year, which isn't chicken feed, and that would knock a dent, at least, into the into the federal deficit. Now let's look at this total direct income. And when you look at the total direct income, what you see here is a pretty much uh, uninterrupted increase under under Bill Clinton, which coincides with the GDP increase, which was uninterrupted. And then it kind of flattens out and goes down a little bit under Bush because that was a recession, the 9-11 uh, attacks. It goes up, it peaks out, and then it begins to crash, you know, and this is, this is your 2008 recession going into 2009 that Obama inherited, and then we have a pretty much a, a, a nice increase going up. Now, if you started to normalize out the recessionary losses, the growth rate for the federal tax revenues averages about 8% when you normalize it for all three of these. Now, I, I, I want to add that when you look at that, it means that federal tax revenue is actually growing faster than the economy. So even under, under Bill Clinton, when the economy was growing at 6%, the tax take out of the economy was growing faster than the economy was growing. That means that the economy is becoming more heavily taxed. And I think that's something people pretty much intrinsically know. Now let's look down here at spending. And you can see spending had a sloping rise. It, and here's a, a sharper increase under Bush, which we know about because that was, you know, the war spending. And then it flattens out. Now this flattening out under Obama really is related to the ending of the war in Iraq. So there wasn't that military spending. But it's also related to the spending sequestration that was forced on Obama even though it came at initially at his uh, own uh, suggestion. But that has, that has had a real effect on federal spending. Look how flat that is. Now, on, you know, on the one hand, Obama does take credit for that. And, you know, listen, I'm not going to even argue that. It, it, he, even though he didn't, he didn't really want it when he had proposed it, it is happening under him, so he does deserve the credit for that. You know, you have to give them credit on something. You can't take it for, away on everything. Okay, let's move on to the next chart, more high-level indicators. And here what we have are business startups, noted in blue, and business failures, noted in, I guess that's sort of an orangey color. 
and it goes back from President Carter to Reagan, Bush, all the way to Obama. Uh, the latest data we have on this is 2012, so it's you know it's three years in arrears on uh, on getting current. But that's just the way the uh, the Census Bureau is on this information. Anyhow, looking at this. It's kind of a hard chart to follow because the line is very jagged, but what you do notice is that the blue line is pretty much always above the orange line, meaning we have more business startups than business failures, which is good for a vibrant and growing economy, except we do have a couple of exceptions. Here, under Reagan, there was one year where business failures actually were greater than business startups, and of course that was the 1981 and 82 recession. And we had a couple of close calls, one here, and that was obviously right after 9-11 when uh, the country was reeling from the attacks. But look under Obama. Here's something that's unprecedented. We went several years where business startups were below, well below, business failures. That's a problem. That's a big problem. Because when you look at history, what you find is that there are more jobs coming out of business startups than existing businesses. So having startups uh, not exceed failures means that we have a real problem in the economy. And, in, and I'll, I will note that in those three years that you saw on that chart, and let's go back to it for a second, on those three years that you see here, the economy was growing. So the economy was not growing in terms of business startups. And that's really a problem because that's where you want the startups to come from because that's where the jobs come from. Okay, let's move on to the next chart. Again, we'll keep it at a high level here. Now we're going to do a little comparison between Reagan and Obama. A lot of a lot of liberals who support President Obama seem to think that he's doing a much better job in the economy with, than Ronald Reagan, and it's, and it's just not true. I mean, it's not even it, – the, the performance of the economy under Reagan and under Obama are not even comparable. Now, if you look at this and trying to compare the GDP growth quarterly, again, this is like the previous chart. The line's very jagged. It's hard to follow, but what you can see – is the orange line here is Reagan, is GDP growth under Reagan, and the, and the gray line is Obama. And as you can see, the orange line for Reagan is consistently above the gray line for Obama, consistently. I mean, there was a little bit here. And this, by the way, these time periods are the quarters that they're in office. So we're comparing the president at, each president at, the same point in their presidency. You can see there's a very big difference here. And this is when the economy really took off under Reagan. And then the growth kind of evened out. And so that's where Obama is now. But Obama does not consistently exceed Reagan. That's, you could say, pretty obviously. He's consistently underperforming where Reagan was. You know, and there's one situation here where you outperformed him in the 22nd and 23rd quarters of his presidency, but more than more often than not, he did not outperform him. So, when you look at the first 24 quarters, quarterly GDP growth under Obama is, you know, when you average all this together, it's 1.6 percentage points, because Obama's been in office for 24 quarters. When you average his gray line out and you average Reagan's orange line out, Obama is 1.6 percentage points of GDP below Ronald Reagan. Let's go to the next chart. Now, this chart really is a cry in shame. And I'll tell you why. Because what this chart is, is, is the long-term unemployed. It's the, well, actually, it is the number of weeks a person is unemployed under every president since the end of the Second World War. And you can see from starting with Truman, a person could expect to remain unemployed. The average person could expect to remain unemployed just a little under 10 weeks, so two and a half months. 
And that has increased slowly but surely. And we we were up around 15, 16, 17, all the way up until President Obama. But once President Obama became president, that number is now still, after six years of the presidency of President Barack Obama, we're at 34 weeks of unemployment. Now, I want to tell you that this number, for a long time during the first four years of President Obama's tenure, was closer to 40 weeks. That's how bad the economy is in terms of jobs. Now, of course, you can't blame the fact that the economy was doing badly in terms of jobs when Obama entered office because he had nothing to do with that. His policies, even President Bush's policies, really didn't have anything to do with that. But what you can hold a president accountable for is what he does in response to it. I mean, nobody blamed the, the Great Depression on Herbert Hoover. What they blamed Herbert Hoover for was the way he responded to it. He didn't. He didn't respond to it with the same vigor that FDR was willing to respond to it. You know, and that was why people have a dim view of, of President Hoover. But looking at this, this is still even today. This is the number. If you are unemployed, you're going to be out eight months. That's a long time to be out of work. So let's go on to the next chart. Now here's the workforce participation rate. And I, I put a lot of caveats in this thing. I put a lot of notes on it, but I want to explain them. So this goes from 1948 all the way up to today. That's the workforce participation rate. Workforce participation, by the way, includes the unemployed. Remember, a person is considered unemployed if they're not working, but they're looking for work. If you're not working and you don't, you aren't even looking for work, even though you're able to work, you're not in the workforce participation rate as, an, as, a, um, as part of the labor force. <clears throat> you're part of the population, but not part of the labor force. So what's important about this chart? Well, what's important, first of all, is that the workforce participation rate today is where it was back in 1977. So we're talking 35 years, 37 years. It's a long time. Now, the reason why I, I put a, uh, a, a range here is I wanted to show that from about 1988 to about 2008, the workforce participation rate stayed within this range. Now, this range is only about 1.2 percentage points. So it's between 65.9 in 1988 and also here in 2008. And 67.1 at the high point. So that's a pretty narrow range where we were at for 20 years. But when the recession happened, look at that. So like straight down, straight down the workforce participation rate. Now, some people have said that that decline under Obama is due to retirements. The aging baby boomers are retiring. Not really true not really true. There are a lot of people that have left the workforce discouraged, but they're able to work and they're of working age. Now, one statistic that we do have is that if you look at the workforce participation rate today, and if it were the same as when Obama entered office, in other words, if we just assume that the workforce participation rate was up here around 65.9, 66%, something like that, as opposed to what it is today, about 62%. If we just assumed that today, then there would be an additional 7.4 million people unemployed, which happens to coincide, by the way, 
pretty close to the number that the Bureau of Labor Statistics itself says have left the workforce but would work if they could find it. And that would mean the unemployment rate isn't 5.3 or whatever it is right now. It would be more like 9.3%. That's devastating. We're in the sixth year of an economic recovery. And there's 7 million people not even in the workforce that could be. That's bad news. Now, I also just referred to the BLS, the Bureau of Labor Statistics, and, and the number that they have. They have 6.4 million not in the workforce who want to work. Uh, you know, my calculation here, just based on the math of using the participation rate, which is admittedly less precise, says 7.4 million. But you can see the numbers are directionally pretty close to each other, within a million. That's not bad, that, you know, in terms of accuracy. Let's go on. Well, let's look at how many jobs did each president create. Well, President Reagan's job creation, and this is through their term in office, this is the accumulated number of jobs either gained or lost. And you could see President Reagan's curve dips because of recession, just like Obama's dips because of recession, and then both go on a steady rise. But look at how much higher than Obama's line, Reagan's line is. See, at this point in their presidencies, Reagan would have created about 10.6 million jobs. Obama had, would have only created, or has only created, 6.4 million jobs. Overall, President Reagan created 16 million jobs. But Obama is behind Reagan by 4 million. And I want to also point out that the United States is significantly higher in population today than it was when President Reagan was president 30 years ago. There's at least 75 or 80 million more Americans out there today, many of whom are in the workforce. So theoretically, just in in terms of the, of the sheer size of the numbers, President Obama should be creating a lot more than this. 6.4 is a very small number, when, and, and Reagan created 10 million with 80 million fewer Americans. So, so think of it that way. I mean, you know, the United States was about 230 million people at the time President Reagan was president. Today, the United States is like 315 million people. And, and, you know, so you would expect there to be more job creation out of this current president in this environment by any president in this environment, really. But there isn't, and that's another sign of a lagging economic performance. Now, one of the things, and this is a kind of a one-off in this, in this package, that I... But, but this bothers me because this is something that's a trend. It, it's happening with presidents, and especially in this presidential administration, it's happening with this president. The president basically lies by telling you the truth. <laughs> it, it's, it's really very disconcerting. And what do I mean by how a president lying by telling you the truth? Well, you may remember when the president said he was going to you know, let the Bush tax cuts expire. A lot of Republicans objected to it because they said it was going to raise taxes on small businesses, and that's going to really hurt people, and, you know, that's not good. And um, President Obama said, well, it's only going to raise taxes on 2% of businesses. And, and that was meant to quell people's fears that Obama was raising taxes on all businesses. But everyone was telling the truth in a very narrow sense. It's true that President Obama's tax, uh, allowing the tax cuts to expire, the tax reductions to expire, would hurt small businesses. That was true. And, and that was the claim of the Republicans. And that is no doubt true. 
But when Obama said that he was only raising taxes on 2% of businesses, he didn't bother to tell people that the 2% of businesses that he was raising taxes on were not small businesses, by the way. They're businesses that employ 100 people or more. That they employ almost 45% of the workforce and they account for 53% of the payrolls, payroll dollars. So he was raising taxes on businesses and it was going to affect the employers of almost half the people working in the country. And this is how President Obama and, and a lot of politicians, but this is how they lie to you by telling the truth. They tell you a fact, but the fact in, in, in its, you know, in a, in a vacuum is true, but it, in context, it's, it, it's not. And I just wanted to bring that up because <clears throat> he's shading the truth. And as I say in this in the blurb that I just I just put in here, you know, it it did affect slightly over two percent of businesses, but by failing to mention that it affects forty five percent of the country working, the president's not being an honest broker with the facts. And and when people don't trust the president to tell them the truth on this, they won't trust to tell him that, that he'll be telling the truth on anything else. It, this kind of distrust fosters greater distrust. It's, it's poisonous. Anyway, I had to get that off my chest. But now I want to turn to something else. I want to explode the myth of peak oil. You know, a few years ago, you heard a lot of people talking about this. They were saying, oh, well, we're running out of oil. We've got to develop new and different kind of, um, kind of uh, uh, alternative fuels. And then all of a sudden, we started to have this fracking revolution, and everything changed. Now, I want to say one thing, though. Let's look at U.S. oil production versus oil demand. Now, here's a chart. It shows oil demand decreasing. And, you know, most of that oil demand decrease is the result of the recession. And then you see this crude oil production increase just booming. This is U.S. oil production. Now, where is that production coming from? Well, look at this chart. Here's California oil production. Basically, in a steady decline, it's, it's now leveled off. It's up slightly. But look at this curve for the North Dakota production, which is the Bakken formation. Look at this curve and compare it to this curve. They're identical. So U.S. oil production is the Bakken formation. That's what's happening. And U.S. exports of petroleum over the past 10 years, look at this. Look at these oil and petroleum exports. They have quadrupled since 2010. 2010, they're only about, you know, a million barrels a day. Now, they're around four and a half million barrels a day. That's all because of these guys in North Dakota. It's, in, it's incredible. It's an incredible story. And here's a, a, a chart on gasoline demand. Which, which basically shows something that is pretty uh, uh, obvious to most people, and that's that gasoline demand basically tracks incomes. Okay, let's get to the next chart. Now, this is how the left misleads with facts. I'm going to go back to that theme from before. Here's a leftist assertion that you may have heard a lot. President Reagan tripled the national debt. Many left this claim, and that was far more fiscally irresponsible than any other president before him or since. But I want to explore how true or false that was. Now, here's two charts. <clears throat> the first chart I have shows the Reagan versus Obama in terms of debt and GDP growth. And the second chart is Reagan versus Obama debt versus GDP percentage growth. Now, I want you to look down here, and you see that Reagan's debt grew 186%. That confirms that Reagan did pretty close to triple 
the national debt while he was in office. But what does that mean in terms of dollars? Well, that's where you go to this chart. It meant that Reagan increased the debt by $1.692 trillion. So Reagan's increase of tripling the debt was really only, in today's dollars, $1.7 trillion approximately. And, but look at GDP. Because, you know, let's take everything in context. What's the, what's the total GDP look like? Well, Reagan increased GDP during his term in office by 83%. So debt went up 186%, nearly triple, but GDP went up 83%, nearly double. And what did that mean in terms of dollars? That meant $2,390,000,000,000. Okay, you getting, you see where I'm going here? Now look at debt for Obama. Obama increased the debt by 87%. So you would say, oh, well, look at Reagan versus Obama, that percentage and that percentage, I mean, obviously Reagan was much worse. And I guess you can say relatively speaking, yes. But look at the debt in terms of dollars. I mean, that's, that's five times the amount of debt that Reagan created. And look at GDP growth for Obama. GDP growth was only 22% so far under Obama, increasing by $3.266 trillion. But that's, that's where I really want to go. Obama's debt increased more than GDP. Reagan was the other way around. So Obama's borrowing money, and the economy isn't growing more than he's borrowing. I mean, that's terrifying, to be perfectly honest with you. Now, here's, a, here's a, another illustration of why that is a problem. Now, Reagan, as a percentage of GDP, the federal debt was only about 50% of GDP. And, and uh, all the way up until the end of the Bush administration, Debt to GDP was about 65%. But when Obama became president, because of all the debt he's incurred, as you saw in the last chart, like over $8 trillion of debt, it's now 104% of GDP. Now, that's important because most economists believe that when nations have debt in excess of 100% of their GDP, they're unable to grow. And that is the problem that we have in the economy right now. We are not growing. And part of it is due to the fact that we have a debt that we shouldn't have. It's way, way over. Now, the debt is way over. And you saw in, in one of the earlier charts that spending has kind of flattened out. So it isn't happening because Obama's growing spending. It's happening because we don't have the wherewithal to cut the spending that we do have. Some people are saying, well, no, this is really an indication that the economy isn't being taxed enough and we need to have more taxes. Uh, no. 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 What we need is more economic growth. That will generate the tax revenue. And the only way to do that, I'll show you in, a, uh, in another presentation, is how to, how to get the economy to grow. We have some of the, some of it is kind of hinted at in this package. Now here's some conclusions about this particular package and what I've been able to do here. The economy under President Obama has underperformed severely when compared to previous econ economic recoveries under previous presidents. It's underperformed in terms of job creation. It's underperformed in terms of economic growth. Those are the two key indicators for people that matter. And also it's underperformed in terms of, uh, in, in terms of uh, median incomes, which I did not show in this package, but median incomes during this current recovery have actually declined. First time ever. 
In this presentation, we have established where the economy has underperformed, as I just said, and the President and his administration have misled the public about it. And while the economy has improved since the day Obama was first inaugurated, absolutely has improved, its underperformance has adversely affected the lives of many millions of people. I want to help you uh, recall the 7 million people, or as the BLS believes, it's 6 million people that are not in the workforce at all, not in the unemployment numbers at all. They're, they're not working. They're not doing anything. They're sitting on the sidelines because they can't find work and they've just given up. That's not even the people who are unemployed. That's another 8 million people. So you're talking somewhere in the vicinity of like 15 million people who are not working, either listed as unemployed or out of the workforce. And that's not including the people who are working jobs that are, that are below the pay level and the work hours that they want, which is several million more. In our next video, we're going to discuss some of the policies that are causing the suboptimal performance and what we can do to change those policies. That's really the purpose of this whole thing, is to first educate you to what the problem is and then to propose what the solutions could be. That's it for me, Tony Cottespie from Great Vocal Majority. Thanks for watching. I appreciate your time. Take care, guys.